Hi, hello, thanks for having me here. I'm going to dive straight into this because I've got a bad feeling it's going to be a bit heavy on content. We'll, 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 we'll see what happens. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to jump straight in to the sorts of problems that we're going to be interested in trying to solve. And it's really a problem of, of sort of flexible understanding, sort of actually a bit of high level cognition. Okay, so I'm going to come along and I'm going to say, tell you that Jane's mother is Alice and Alice's brother is Bob. And I've told you two pieces of information. But with those two pieces of information, you actually know more. You know, for example, that Bob is Alice, uh, Jane's uncle, sorry. And you know all of these other relationships as well. I only told you two things, but you can infer many, many more. Um, and uh, this is really kind of a bit like taking a shortcut in some relational space, some sort of idea of a shortcut here. Of course, we don't just want to understand one family, but what we really want to do is we want to take this sort of relational, oops, sorry, this relational understanding we have, and we want to be able to transfer that to a new family so we can understand this new family as fast as possible. We can make inferences, who's related to who, and so on. As I said, this problem is not just bespoke to people and their families. It's really a problem that you and I do every day in understanding space, for example. We go around in a loop in this building. We know we're going to be back in the same place even though we've never done it. So the question that we're trying to tackle here is what are the algorithms to solve these sorts of problems um, and how does the brain do it? Well, we happen to know how the brain, uh, well, we have some insights at least in how the brain does it. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is a, um, uh, the brain solves it using these two areas of the brain called the hippocampus and um, the areas of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And neuroscience has done lots and lots of recordings of neurons in these areas. So here's an example of a, a, a single cell an animal, I'm not sure you can see, okay, an animal has this black trajectory is an animal's running around and running, running around and around, and every dot is where this single cell has fired. So this cell is called a grid cell, in fact, it won a Nobel Prize in 2012. And there's lots of other cells that respond to space as well, like these object vector cells, border cells, place cells, landmark cells, so tons and tons and tons of space that are really involved in this, uh, uh, this problem of mapping space and allowing you to make those inferences. As I said, it's not just this area of the brain, this hippocampal formation, that solves these problems, builds models of the world. It's also the front of your brain uh, called prefrontal cortex. But before that, I should say one special thing about all of these cell representations is that they just tell you about like where you are, the right, they tell you about the right here, right now. That's all that they tell you about. Okay, but this other bit of the brain called the prefrontal cortex also solves similar sorts of problems, but it does it in a kind of a weird way. It does it in a very different way to what these cells are doing. In fact, rather than just telling you about the right here and right now, it tells you about everything all at the same time. So it tells you about your past, your future. It tells you if, like all of the neurons are encoding everything at the same time, rather than just coding right what's going on right here, right now. So there's a real puzzle about that. It's a real pickle of what's going on. So we're, we're going to try to understand that. So the first questions that we're going to try to tackle, we're going to try to say, well, first, how on earth do we solve these sort of relational, these inferences problems? How do we discover the right algorithms for them? Uh, and the second one is what earth algorithms are actually the brain is going on. Why has it got these two different things? And what are these two different things? I'm going to try to tackle these by kind of really formalizing the puzzle, formalizing this puzzle of relational inferences as a sequence learning problem, sort of thing that, you know, is a bread and butter to machine learners. Okay, so here is the sequence. Uh, and I'm going to give you some stream of sensory stimuli and relationships. And Judy, you're just going to see the top bit. Uh, and that seems kind of, so you're going to see like light bulb, right, broom, down, and so on. You're going to get to banana, and I ask you, what happens when you go up? That sequence alone sounds quite hard to tackle. But if you had this, uh, some sort of understanding of this relational backbone, you can then place down that sequence on this backbone. And now when you get to banana, and the question is, what happens when you go up? That's easy, because we know that we've been to the light bulb before, so it's going to be the light bulb. Uh, and so I, I just trying to illustrate the fact that just this predict the sequence prediction problem is really the same thing as having these uh, um, understanding relationships and inferring relationships. Okay, yes, we can predict the light bulb. And this uh, idea of sequences is not just true for space, it's also true for these other problems, like these families. So here is an example of a family that we can just represent as a sequence. You're sort of traversing this graph, this family tree graph. And perhaps it's clear that there's, two components that you need to solve these puzzles. The first component is you really need to have some sort of understanding, abstract knowledge of what this relation, relational structure is, because that's the thing that's going to transfer to every, every different family. But then you also need some notion of a memory so that I can bind together who goes where in each family. There's like two components. Understand 
this, this sort of relational thing, be able to navigate it, plus have a memory. Okay, so that sort of speaks to a possible model that might be able to do this. And that's just you can bind together some R and N or current neural network, which we know solves these sequences. We can bind that together with some sort of memory store, which can you know, store memories. That's, of course, not the only way you can solve this puzzle. You could just solve it just with an R and N, because that, for example, can walk around, it can understand sequences, and it has its own internal memory as well in, in the dynamics of the RNN and the hidden state of the RNN. So these are two possible algorithms or two possible sort of methodologies you might go around explaining this, uh, um, uh, uh, capturing this phenomena. And so I'm going to try to now show you that in, indeed these two are the two different ways you can do it, and they really correspond to the two different brain regions as well. Okay, so I'll try to elucidate that a bit now. Um, but I've, I've said it at a very, very high level. I've said, hey, an RNN and a memory, but you know, so what? But I guess what we want to know is exactly how an RNN and some memory could actually solve these puzzles. So that's what we're going to do first. Okay, so let's first think about if I've got a recurrent neural network and it's got some external memory to store, how could it solve these puzzles? Well, firstly, it does solve the puzzles. So what I'm showing here at the bottom is just two different, two different types of tasks at like this, and it solves them no problem. Uh, the question is, how is it doing it? Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to go a little bit fast over this because it's the, the less interesting of the, of the two. Uh, but what it does is it uh, has some recurrent neural network. Okay, that's great. This is our recurrent neural network. Uh, and then we've got some external memory system. And this external memory system, this is, this is actually what it ends up learning. I haven't baked this in. But it ends up learning something where it separates it uh, uh, into your external memory system into some keys and values, where your keys are just past states of your recurrent neural network. And your values are, what do I observe at each location? OK, so why would this make sense? Uh, this would make sense because let's say I'm at this ear at, right down at the bottom. Then I'm going to have some representation for this location, this position right here. And when I move forwards now, then I can just track and I just clock forwards my RNN. I sort of update my position representation of my RNN. And I move forwards again. I, I clock forwards my position representation of my RNN. And that's great because every time I just clock it forwards, I can just do a look up, a lookup table into this external memory system, and I can retrieve the right thing. I can make my predictions just by using a lookup table. And so that's like the, the theory of what we expect we should find in this in this system, which is an RNN to a memory store. And that is really what exactly you do find. Okay. You find this the, the RNN, the algorithm it uses is it encodes positions. It encodes positions in a way that's true across any different family, any different space, whatever it is. It just encodes the position. That's what's going on. OK, however, what happens in this other situation? This one where we just have an RNN and the internal memory, I just an RNN. OK, so that's this, that's this situation. Um, well, first off, it also solves the task. It doesn't do quite as well. It doesn't scale to the bigger task sizes, but it does solve the tasks. It does do it. Um, uh, second off. It does not use a position representation. If you try to decode position, you're at chance. It does not use position. It does something different. So what I'm going to try to explain now is what it's doing different. And it's kind of funky. Well, this is like the hypothesis. Of this. The hypothesis is now we have within our RNA, which is up here, we have these different neural subspaces. And there's one subspace that sort of accepts your input. And then it just copies and shifts that, that knowledge around. Okay, So here, we're at the ear. We uh, at the ear, we receive some input. This is just saying you're at the ear, you're seeing it here. We load that into this one neural subspace. Then we move. And what happens is uh, that whatever was in this subspace moves up to this subspace. Then we start, uh, get a new input and then we move. And whatever's in that subspace, they just clock along again. We observe a new piece of information. And let's say we, um, we go forwards again. Uh, they all, they all, well, in this case, we went backwards, sorry. And then they all rotated backwards, okay? So whatever was in a subspace, they just get copied and shifted around among subspaces. Kind of a weird mechanism, um, but that's really what actually goes on. So for example, you can come along and you can decode, this has got a unique signature in what the RNN would look like. And that's exactly what you find. These blue lines, exactly this unique signature. And this orange line is just an, another, another possible option, which is not what's going on. Okay, so this weird mechanism of, taking some neural subspaces, copying and shifting the contents around, is really what these RNNs learn. Kind of weird. But it's what goes on, in these artificial RNNs at least. Uh, one point uh, is that these two things, as you might imagine, this, uh, this sort of uh, 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 this external memory versus this internal memory uh, system, 
They are doing exactly the same computation. So there's two different algorithms. They discovered two different discovered algorithms. And in fact, mathematically, you can show that they're completely identical. They do exactly the same thing. There's a transformation between one and the other, totally identical. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you that RNNs do, at least in these tasks, they do really learn these two different algorithms uh, if, you, if one's got an external memory and one doesn't. Uh, the question, though, is what on earth does the brain actually use? And so now we're going to, I'm going to try to show you that um, this is now just a, a slightly more elaborate version, but this is the RNN this external memory. And I'm going to try to show you once you train that on these tasks, you observe all of the same cells that you see in the brain, in this, this one bit of the brain, so the hippocampal formation. So for example, you train it, you observe things that look like grid cells. These are these, these famous uh, cells. You observe band cells, place cells, border cells, object vector cells. Place cells again, sorry, I shouldn't say that. And landmark cells. So you observe all of these cell types in this model. That's a lot of evidence that it suggests that this is what this, um, this, is, this is what area of the brain is doing. But because this model is not just a spatial model, it's like a generic model, it can be anything. We can also train it in more complicated tasks. We can train it in these funky tasks where now we're both in space, but we have a cognitive task to do in space. So it's not just space, but we're doing a cognitive task on. It also learns all of these other cells. I'm not going to have time to explain what every cell is. So I'm just flashing up pretty pictures and, and um, hoping to look good. But it, the point is the same model. It learns all of these different types of cell types or, or neurons that people have found in these brain areas on a whole spectrum of tasks. It really actually more or less covers every single cell type discovered in this brain area. Okay. Five minutes. Okay, great. Uh, and um, so, yeah, same principles capture all the cells, okay? That's basically what this brain area is doing. So RNN plus an external memory. Uh, okay, I, uh, it's also the case that you can make some new experiment, experimental predictions from this uh, model as well, but I'm not going to run into that. Okay, so that was some evidence that RNN plus external memory is what hippocampus is doing. Uh, so it... One bit of the brain is choosing one of the algorithms. What about the other bit of the brain? Uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time here. Uh, so here is a task. Here's a task where you get a monkey. You get a monkey, you instruct it to, um, there's got six on a the screen. There's six things that the monkey can look at. And you show it a sequence of three things. You show it a sequence of maybe this one, and this one, and this one. And after you've shown it that sequence of three things, you then ask it, it its job in life is to repeat those three things. So it has to look. So card that one, then that one, then that one, has to repeat the sequence. Um, and what they discover is they discover that exact weird property of they have these three separate neural subspaces, each containing the content of what, what appeared first, second, or third. Exactly like what our model suggested. And that's exactly what we see as well when we train an RNN on this. And so what's going on here is there's just three subspaces, like what we saw before subspace for the first one, second one, third one, and they just get clocked around, clock, 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 round. That's what frontal cortex is doing here. This is not just one task we see as in, we see as in another task. Here's a, here's a pretty cool task. But now we show two stimuli, one on the top, one on the bottom, uh, and then we give it a cue. I want you to tell me what, you know, then the cue, then these objects go away, and then I give it a cue. I want you to present me the top one or the bottom one, and the monkey has to choose what goes on. And so what first they discover is before the cue, these two things, they're represented in orthogonal subspaces. That's what they discover. And then after you see the cube, they're represented in parallel subspaces. That's the data. That's what the data says. And again, if we train these models, that's exactly what happens. And that's because the model is that there's just two slots here. There's a slot for the top, slot for the bottom. And then whenever you're trying to read out, you just rotate the thing into a readout slot. Perfect. Captures all of that data. This idea doesn't just capture the past data, but we also developed a new um, uh, a new experiment to capture this, uh, which I don't think I'll have time to go through, um, but it's a similar sort of task. We're just doing many things in order. Now there's a delay. This model makes predictions of uh, a new class of cells, sort of progress cells, which now sort of clock you through progress because now what my contents of each slot, uh, is, you know, there's, there's a delay period between each slot. So I need to, to progress it through some, some pseudo slot, some fake slot. And that's what you need these progress cells for. We find them in the brain as well. And then we also find these funky slot cells as well. And again, I'm not going to go through them, but we also find them in the brain as well. OK, so to summarize, for these sequence memory tasks, these, these algorithms of understanding sequences, these schemas, these relational inferences, there's two possible algorithms for solving them. Okay, 
ways that I've thought of so far. And one is this RNN with internal memory versus RNN with external memory. So when we train an artificial neural network, which I haven't baked in anything, I baked in nothing, it discovers those two different algorithms. Okay. Uh, and uh, when comparing it to the brain, it really looks like these two different brain areas, hippocampal formation corresponds to this case, prefrontal cortex corresponds to this case. And with that, uh, I will thank you guys and um, thank everyone I work with.